continue our scripture readings this morning, this time from the gospel according to Mark, Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Listen for God's holy word. Then he began to speak to them in parables. He that is Jesus. A man planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit for the wine press, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the season came, he sent a slave to the tenants to collect from them his share of the produce of the vineyard. But they seized him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And again, he sent another slave to them. This one they beat over the head and insulted. Then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others. Some they beat, others they killed. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they seized him, killed him, and threw him out of the vineyard. What then will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Eternal God, may your word be our word and your ways be our ways. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. It was a successful Christmas open house. Yesterday, the lower commons right out there uh, were filled with people and food and Christmas spirit. It wasn't exactly the way Brenda and I are used to doing it. We normally love having our open house at our house. We hope to return there next year. But as far as Christmas open houses go, it was a success. Brenda, my wife, was concerned that she had lost her knack, that the pandemic had caused our party-throwing skills to become a tad rusty, and that we might not know how to make it happen, especially in an alternate venue. But she still got it. Sausage balls were still sausagey. Eggnog was still quite noggy. And the new peanut butter snowballs were quite peanut buttery. It was a success. We like Christmas success, even though that means a little something different for every person. For me, Christmas success means living through Christmas Eve. And then getting up on Christmas Day around 11 a.m., opening a gift or two, and then eating Brenda's homemade tamales for the remainder of the day. People used to invite me to early Christmas morning stuff. I'm not getting up early on Christmas Day. Many Christmas Eves, I didn't get home from work until 1 a.m. I'm sleeping late. For me, that's Christmas success. What does a successful Christmas look like for you? Food, gifts, clothes, trips, fancy worship services on Christmas Eve that fill you with the Christmas spirit, only to argue on the way home in the car? What does Christmas success really look like? We go of all places to Mark chapter 12 to find out. This is the hardest, most difficult 
to hear and understand of the three beloved stories in Mark. The first beloved story we heard was from Mark chapter 1, Jesus' baptism, and the Father's response to Jesus' obedience was this, I love you. You are beloved. The second beloved story was from Mark chapter 9. It was the transfiguration story. Before the very eyes of the three disciples, Peter, James, and John, Jesus is transformed. And then the voice of God is heard. This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Both times, Mark wanted us to know what a wonderful difference it makes when we recognize beloved. But in Mark chapter 12, Mark wants us to know what a terrible tragedy can result, and how capable we can become of something awful when we fail to recognize beloved. We heard it earlier from Mark chapter 12, beginning with verse 1, then he, that is Jesus, began to speak to them in parables, and he tells a story about a vineyard. A guy built a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a pit, built a watchtower, and leased it to people, and then left the country. And when the season came, Mark says, that is, when it came time for the grapes to produce fruit, for the, uh, for the wine to be made, for the profit to be earned, he sent a slave, the owner did, to the tenants to collect his share of the produce of the vineyard. I need a little wine from you. I need a little rent money. Verse 3 said they seized the owner's representative, beat him, and sent him away empty-handed. And so the owner didn't seem to take any other action except to send another slave. This one they beat over the head and insulted Verse 5, then he sent another, that one they killed. And so it was with many others, Mark said. Some they beat, some they killed. Verse 6, he had still one other. This last one was his beloved son. And so finally he sent his son to them, saying to himself, surely they will respect my son. But the tenants... They said, that's the heir. That's the son of the guy who owns the vineyard. If we kill him, we might just be able to take ownership of the vineyard for ourselves. So they do. They kill him. They throw his body outside of the vineyard. And verse 9 says, asks the question, how do you suppose the owner of the vineyard is going to respond to this latest outrage. Mark says, the owner will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to someone else. And then Mark says, haven't you heard this scripture before? The psalm that Leanna read for us earlier? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. This is not a realistic story at the literal level, the story of the vineyard that we hear from Mark. It's not meant to be. It's more a story reflecting the history of God dealing with Israel, how God sent many prophets to God's chosen people, how many of them were rejected and killed, and how in Mark's Christology, Jesus stands firmly rooted in the story of God's dealing with Israel. Jesus is, in fact, for Mark, the climax and fulfillment of God's plan for human history. In Mark's story, The Lord of the vineyard creates an environment that contains everything necessary for wine-making success. 
the fence to keep the animals from eating the grapes, the pit for the wine press, a watchtower to keep guard. Even the grapes themselves have already been planted. Success seems guaranteed. But the tenant, Not the owners of the vineyard, but the tenants, people using the vineyard by permission of the owner. The tenants don't honor their agreement with the owner. And every time the owner sends an emissary to the tenants, they either beat that person up or straight up kill him. Finally, the owner sends his son, his beloved son, verse 6 says. He had still one other, Mark says, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. God sends his son, his beloved son into the world. Mark chapter 12 is really an incarnation story. God sending his son into the world in human form, God becoming human in form of the Christ child, which means, believe it or not, there's a little Christmas in this vineyard story. Only this story is not one of Christmas success. Verse 7, we heard it a moment ago. Those tenants said to one another, this is the heir This is the son of the guy who owns the vineyard. Let's kill him and the inheritance will be ours. They were right. He was the heir. Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah. But they were wrong to think that they could somehow kill him and get away with it. That they could somehow kill him and inherit everything. They were quite wrong to think that they could successfully overcome the Lord of the vineyard. The owner returns. And Mark says he destroys the wicked tenants and gives the vineyard to someone else. The vineyard itself is not destroyed and replaced with another vineyard, but leadership is taken away from the scribes and priests and elders who rejected Jesus and is given to Jesus and his disciples. That's what this story is all about. And then Mark says in verse 10, Have you not read this scripture? Have you not heard this before? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is amazing in our eyes. Verse 10 of Mark is actually a retelling of Psalm number 118. We go back to that Psalm. Verse 22 from Psalm 118 says, The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Then verse 24 from the Psalm. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us. We beseech you, O Lord. Beseech is an old school word. Anybody beseech anything out there these days? That's an impassioned plea for something to happen. We're begging you. We beseech you, O Lord. Give us success. Verse 25 of the psalm that Mark himself quotes in his third and final beloved story says, give us success. What does Christmas success look like? Why doesn't Christmas work for some people? Maybe it's because the builders 
threw out the cornerstone. Jesus is the cornerstone of Christmas. And when you make something else, anything else, the cornerstone of Christmas, it's not likely to succeed. Christmas success requires beloved. Jesus has to be loved. And then in the name of Jesus, others around us have to be loved. The beginning of others becoming beloved is when we recognize Jesus as the cornerstone, as God's beloved. And when we fail to recognize beloved, we can become capable of some hurtful things. The wicked vineyard tenants didn't recognize a beloved son. All they could see was a potential payoff, and they became capable of brutality. And when we see the people around us as anything but beloved children of God, we become capable of hurtful and sometimes even brutal thoughts, words, and behaviors. We hosted the Southwest Pyramid Holiday Concert last week here in the church. It was the choirs of the Southwest High School along with all the choirs from their feeder schools like J.T. Stevens and the other elementary schools and middle schools that feed Southwest High School. It was a big crowd. And when all the choirs joined together for their final selection, it was Michael John Trotta's Veni Veni Emmanuel. That's an amazing, energetic ostinato. It's a repeated musical phrase calling for the coming of Emmanuel. When all those choirs were up here en masse singing that piece together, this chancel was the fullest I've ever seen since I've been here at Arbor Lawn. Later that evening, after the concert was over and many of the students and families had left the sanctuary, I walked out onto the West Lawn to see what was going on. There were a number of kids out there, kids who had performed that night, other kids who had attended the performance. They were all hanging out, doing what kids do, which was taking pictures of one another with their phones. They were taking pictures of themselves out in front of our wonderful Christmas tree, the one we put up outside for our festival of lights. And I just watched from a little distance. I just listened to what was going on. And I heard a kid say this. This is a true story. That kid said, I didn't know church did this. I didn't know church did this. And I wondered to myself, did what? Put up a Christmas tree for the community? Open the doors of their facility for a group of kids and parents who are different from them? And then I wondered, what does that kid think church does? I wonder what some of those kids might have experienced from church. I wonder if their experience of church, this church, that church, any church, I wonder if they've always been made to feel beloved. As though they belonged. 
as though they mattered, as though they themselves were truly beloved children of God. The very same God who loves us. That's the stone. That's the stone that too many would-be builders of community have rejected. That God has come into the world in human form to save human beings, all human beings. Those who look like us, those who look different from us. And at our best, at our best, that's what we proclaim. In Christ, there is no Jew or Greek, male or female, Republican or Democrat, black or white. All are one, the Apostle Paul says in Christ Jesus. All are beloved. What if that? were the cornerstone of our Christmas? Would we finally achieve that most elusive of Christmas objectives? Success. Let us pray. Lord, give us success. Success in Christ. That we might proclaim this message this holiday season and beyond by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the incarnation of the Christ child. All are beloved. All are offered redemption and reconciliation with God. All are beloved. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.